Well, I'm all wired. They got me all wired in the back room with that praising and worshiping stuff, you know, where you stand still. No, I can't stand still. Why would we stand still? Where are you going to go when you croak? Where are you going to go? You know, I, I was talking to somebody the other day. Just think about this. Here you are, and this is a part of my message, and then Pastor Kenny is going to come forth and really give you some sweet stuff. Now, think about this here. Here I am. I'm living life, and I'm looking at just the earth today. I'm just looking at my wealth, everything I want. I want this new. I want that new. How about after you die, Aaron? Where in the world are you going to go, baby? Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go when you die? You have a choice. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says to choose this day what you're going to do. And he says choose life. That means choose that you're going to go to heaven. Why would you go to heaven? Because you don't want to go to hell. Some people like it hot. Keisha, this is too hot for you. We're not going there. I'm going to heaven. And when I found out that, and when I asked Jesus into my heart, it was like I catapulted into another frequency. And it was God's frequency. And just think, we get to have a covenant with the Father, the great El Elyon. That's his Hebrew name. He's the great high God. There's no God like him. No Buddha, none of this other junk. No, our God is the great hard, high God, and he supplies all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But this is what I love to do. I love to tell people, don't mind him. Don't look at Keegan. Don't look at him. I'll hang him on the Christmas tree. He, he's, he knows all about that. Between him and Michael, they know all about that soundboard. Oh, geez. You taught him well, Aaron. So now, but looking at that, and looking at young people, and you're looking at a career. What, what are you looking And you're planning this all out. Then all of a sudden, you hit the wall. Um, I decided I don't want to do that anymore. See, I wanted to go to beauty culture school. But my dad said, well, your sister Vaughn didn't do anything with it. We're not going to send you. Well, pr wait a minute. No, no, no. I didn't like it at the time, but guess what? I wouldn't be here today became the best alcoholic anybody ever had at that time for a woman. But now look at this. When you're looking on planning a state, planning insurance, planning your funeral, how about after? That's what we should spend more time on because you're only here for how many years? 70, 80, 90, 120, 200 years, and then where you're going to go forever and ever and ever. That's what we got to look at. That's why it's so important to tell people about it and give them that gift for Christmas. Oh, you're, they're going to laugh at me. They're going to get mad at me. I really don't care if they get mad at me. You've got a gift of life you can give to them. So what I want to share this morning, and then we're going to take communion, so have that ready in a minute, would you please? But see this little book. I love my little books. I love my little books, okay. And this one is by Charles Capps again. But I, I want you to think on this, and this is on page 7, because you want to sometimes go back and recap what you're seeing. Because you want to know what to do in the kingdom of God to inherit, what did I say? Your inheritance. We have an inheritance. How many are operating in their inheritance? I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Why? Am I to the pinnacle where I need to be? No. That's why I study. That's why I pray. That's why, you know, when it says in Romans 4.17, call things, not the way they are. Call them the way you want them to be. So what am I going to call in? What's the first thing we want to call in? Money. No, no. I call wisdom. I call revelation. I call the knowledge of God. I call for the eyes of my understanding to be open, to be enlightened, so that I will know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of his glory. There, I just prayed the opening. You're calling because wisdom is far more than any kind of money you could have. Look at the dollar bill. The symbols on it are so satanic. It, once I look at it, I'm thinking, oh, it's so bad. 
look at your dollar bill sometimes and see all the satanic things on it. You won't treasure it. But it's, 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 it's a tool. It's a currency on this earth. But we have a currency, which is faith, which is believing God. That's for the heavenlies. So what does he say in here? And the reason, you know what? You don't have to tithe. You don't have to give off. You don't have to do nothing but die someday, okay? But we get to tithe. We get to give off. We get to do that because we have a covenant, Mary, with the Most High God. Now, how do I get in involved with my part of the covenant? How do I get involved with that? He lets me get involved right here. He... So when I get involved, what am I doing? I'm saying, oh, I have to give this. And if I don't give this, something bad's going to happen to me. I don't want to say bad words, but Jiminy Crickets, forget that. No. You know, you're just showing God you don't trust him. So when we give, when we give, that's a part of the covenant. And we're giving because we're saying, I have a covenant with you, Daddy. And this is my part. And I give myself through that earthly currency. And what does he give back to me? The desires of my heart. So he says here, Charles Cap, act as God would act. I have heard people say, those people who confess God's word and say promises of God over and over again, they're just trying to act like God. Do you ever hear that? I used to hear that all the time. You don't hear that now as much. Yes, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Act as God would act in a similar situation. We know how God would act in a bad situation. Now, what did he do in Genesis 1-3? He did a Romans 4-17. It was dark upon the earth. What did he call out of the darkness? Light. Well, you know, I like to call things the way they are, you know, I'm, I'm one of these, I, I'm, that's just the way I am. I call it the way it is, Christina. No, if you call it the way it is happening right now, okay, then you're not stepping into your inheritance, which is from God, and you're not calling those things out of the darkness. So God says, don't call for what you already have. Call for what you see in this word. And when you call this and you say, I have wisdom, I have revelation knowledge, I have joy, I have peace. Oh, just think of all that. We have got it made, you guys. I, I, I can't help it. You know, and inside sometimes it feels like my heart has got tears running down it of joy thinking of what God has given me. And, I, and I, you know, and I'm not bragging on being an ex-alcoholic and smoking and stuff, but, you know, when you let the worldly things go and you grab onto him, oh, I have more fun. See, when I used to get drunk, that wasn't pretty. Then the next day, so sick. I just have fun going on and on and on. That's what we can have. Again, I tell you, we girls go shopping and we have on. We even get the, the, the people that work there involved, don't we? They have fun with us. Where are your girls from? God. So now, what are we to do? Call those things. This is God's way of doing it. He says, call. You're in this world. Call from what is out of this world into this world. So call. Bill's paid. Write it right across. Bills paid. You got problems with a child? Call that child into order. Call that child joy, peace, saved. Oh, marriage. I call my marriage into order in Jesus' name. See, we're calling things that are not into order according to the word of God. And that's what he wants us to do. So you say, if, if I say I'm wealthy, then I'm lying because I'm not wealthy. 
No. He said, when you speak this word, and this word says you are wealthy, he says he will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory, not yours. We get this teeny little thing. Oh, if I only had a million dollars. That's peanuts for God. What if you were a multi-billionaire? What if you could turn around and you could pray and you could see somebody that had a need and you could help that need? See, the bank should be coming to the Christians. But see, one of the little problems, and I'm sure you guys don't do that, we look to our flesh and spend the money on our flesh, but do we sow it into the kingdom why in the world would I do that? Because you're saying, I trust you, God, that everything that's in this word, you're going to give it to me. Yeah. So when I praise and worship you, you're saying the walls of Jericho, when they went around the walls of Jericho, and they praised and worshiped, and on the seventh day, how many times did they go around? Seven times. And what did they do? They start praising God. And God came on the scene and took those walls and whoosh, made him into a ramp, and they went and took it. No casualties. That's what praising and worshiping does. That's why I can't help it. My, I just got to let loose and praise and worship him because I can see it. When you start seeing things that happen, that's what's exciting. Now, we're going to take communion, and then we're going to come up and praise and worship. So let's pass out the communion. Thank you, Jesus. Did everybody have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah. Not as good as mine. It was good. And even the day after was good. And even the day after that was good. And today is even better. You know why? You know what? Hey, think about this. You think, I don't feel good. Or you think, I don't have enough money for this, or I don't have this and that. <laughs> Get this right now. Shut up. Where are you going to go when you croak, when you die? Where are you going to go? Heaven. Why are you worried about this tiddly little stuff here? Just start praising and worshiping God, and God says, I'll just give you overflow beyond what you could ever imagine. See, Kenny's so blessed he's got me. Let's just not talk about it today. Okay. <laughs> so now... What, what is the purpose of communion? See, you have this covenant, and that's why you're giving, because you trust him. I don't trust myself. I don't. Because my flesh will cooperate with the world. I'm going to cooperate with God, and that's why I want to stay in his word. But every time you, a farmer puts a seed in the ground, does he walk away and say, oh, I hope it produces no, 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 he's praying for rain. She's praying for rain. They fertilize that. Speak over it if they're smart. And they're going to get a bumper crop. And they'll be getting more than their neighbor or more than somebody else. And, and they go, how'd you do that? You see, I am God's favorite child. And see, he will not withhold anything from me. That's why we have a covenant because he's made everything possible for you. Now we take this bread, which is his body, and we break it because his body was broken. Right now, you take your healing in Jesus' name. While Debbie's up here praising and worshiping with the team, they're going to praise and worship. You take whatever you want and take those walls of Jericho down in the name of Jesus. Let's eat. Thank you, Father. Mm. God is good. Now, the blood. Get this image in you. Get this image in you. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your DNA changed inside of you. <laughs> it's G-O-D. That's your DNA now. Why wouldn't you get excited about that? Oh, I'm just not that kind of person that good excited get out of my way. I'm going to take all the blessings and my walls are going to come down and there's going to be a ramp in and I'm going to go and take what belongs to me. But don't ask me for any of mine when I get it. Go yourself. So now we drink this because we have a covenant in the name of Jesus.
Der big man up. And we are prepared to give. And then don't forget, thank God when you're praising and worshiping for whatever you have need of in your body. Okay? Got it? And you're speaking over this here. Because this is you. You're giving you. You don't give somebody else's. You give what you worked with. Got it? Well, if somebody gives you birthday money, Pastor Jan, do you pay tithes off that? Absolutely. I said to Andrew Womack, what do you pay tithes on? An offering. He said, everything that goes through my hands. Think about that. Everything that goes through your hands. <laughs> Some of you have given me hallelujah handshakes. I either put them in here or I give them to somebody else. So you're getting twice double for your trouble. So let's praise and worship him. Let's do it. Stand. Take what belongs to you. You know, you do not keep account, he says, of what you have sown into the kingdom of God, into your church, into ministries. But God keeps a record of everything that you have sown. You have forgotten about different times you have sown. And you have named that seed. And you forgot about it. But he didn't forget. And he said, it's coming now. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Just like the Hoover Dam was opened up and taking you over. Oh, oh, so start praising him on your way home. When you get home, praise and worship him so that he can open those floodgates of heaven and it can just pour out over you, over your family. In the precious name of Jesus, do you agree? Amen. Thank you, Father. And Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. And I decree and declare that each person that's given, that Father God, oh, 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 that the glory of God will overtake them, overshadow them, and things will happen that they just have no, no understanding, but they will understand it was you because they trusted you. And they are going to be given the desires of their hearts that they never even knew they had. In Jesus' name, do you agree? Amen. 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 Pastor Kenny, come on up and take over. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Everyone having a good day? Yes. Yeah. Okay. A couple things I want to do first before we get into what we're going to do today. You may be seated. Thank you. <clears throat> so... Um, you know, sometimes I wonder if people are watching online, but I found out last Sunday Jeff and Dixie were actually watching online they always do. because I got a text message after service, and Jeff said, go ahead, pick on us all you want <laughs> because somebody has to be the role model. <laughs> okay, Jeff, Dixie, you are the role models. So anyway, anyway. Uh, too, then I just want to um, congratulate Sam and his basketball team. They played in a tournament yesterday, and they took the championship. Yeah. So, they uh, usually in these tournaments, there's a number of teams that usually are pretty comparable to your team. Well, Appleton North is, you know, it's kind of a rivalry between Kimberly and Appleton North. So they have, if they get to the championship round, usually it's Kimberly and Appleton North. Well, they beat Appleton North. In the, yeah, that's, it doesn't matter. If you win by one point, you won. <laughs> so, so any, you know, um, I was watching, kind of watching the scoreboard as the time was running down, and the scoreboard kept flopping around. First, it would show score one way, and then they'd show another way. Um, I don't know if the, the guy on the scoreboard was getting confused or whatever, but they, 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 didn't, they didn't watch the scoreboard. They paid attention to the game they were playing and handling the ball. So 
congratulate them guys. And Sam, <coughs> tell your teammates they did a great job. So and we had fun around that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway. Um, I got a story this morning. There was this Christian woman. She was she got on the plane a little bit ahead of time. She sat down in her seat, and what'd she do right away? She pulled out her Bible and she started reading in her Bible. Well, as passengers came in, this guy came in and sat down next to her, and he says to her, do you believe all that stuff that's in there? And she says, yeah, I do. Yeah, I believe it all. It's the word. And he says, well, um, what about that guy that was swallowed up by the whale? Yeah, I believe that too, she said. He says, you, you, uh, how, how could you be positive? How could that possibly be that he was swallowed up by a whale, and it was spit out right there. And she says, I don't know. She thought about it a moment. She said, I don't know. But when I get to heaven, I will ask him, how did it happen? He said, kind of sarcastic to her, well, what if he's not in heaven? And she just smiled and said, then you can ask him. <laughs> so, so, so sometimes we got to be sharp. So today, we're going to do a DVD. It says the, uh, the title of it is Crossing the Defining Line of the Gospel. What is uh, the defining line? You know, I, I like to compare it and, uh, um, to, uh, to a football game. You know, you got a goal line. That's kind of the defining line, isn't it? If you, get a, if you stay on this side of the line, you didn't score. If you get on the other side of the line, you scored. So you, you won. So that's, that's what we're going to talk about today. So anyway, a couple things. <clears throat> First of all, you know, I, I asked those questions of manhood. So, you know, periodically I'm looking at them questions and say, saying to myself, uh, are you doing these things? So I, I've been really working on this. <laughs> that I'm, I'm doing these things that I asked about manhood, you know. So last Sunday, Pastor Jan was getting dressed to go to church, and I was already dressed, and I said to her, um, that red dress really looks nice, but it really shows your rolls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I, anyway, I caught myself. But it really looks good. Your rolls still look good on you. <laughs> or did I? Did I cry? Or did I belt him? Where's that black and blue mark? See that over his right eye there? I don't cry easy, remember? <laughs> so, so, anyway, the black and blue mark. I'll tell you how I got the black and blue mark. <laughs> So I got up at night and it's dark in our room and I was going to go into the bathroom. Well, I walked right into the door <laughs> that, that was stick partly open. That's when the counselor tells, tells the truth about the Lord. So we already know that one. We know there's more of the story. So anyway, when I walked into the door, it hurt. <laughs> and so... <laughs> right away, right away, I was going to go, Jan, why did you leave that door open? And I caught myself. No, maybe it was me that left that door open. <laughs> so, so I walked into it. So we got to, you know, the Holy Spirit needs to arrest you at times. So, you know, what comes out of your mouth? <laughs> and, and who's at fault? And when it's, you know, whose fault it really is. So anyway... I encourage you guys to go through that question list and see how you're doing on it, you know, where, you're at, where you're at with it. So anyway, the, the, the reason I'm not following up on the, on the DVDs in the order that Creflo had them, um, the Holy Spirit was talking to I and Pastor Jan this week. When, you go, when you're out on the highway and... You know, all of a sudden you see traffic backing up. What do you do? Put the brakes on, don't you? That's what was come to us. That came to us. We need to put the brakes on a little bit 
that we're piling too much on week after week and give you a chance to digest it, what we're going through. So, you know, it's really easy for a guy to say, oh, yeah, I'm doing all those things. Oh, yeah, I don't have to listen to that. And you walk out of here and you don't listen to it or you don't practice it. So that's how we want to just give you a time. And we may go back to some of those original ones instead of going on. So um, we want to do that. So today's a DVD is crossing the defining line of the gospel. And <clears throat> in this DVD, um, I'm going to say a little bit about it before we do it, and we're going to play it and let you digest it. So um, one of the things uh, Creflo talks about in this DVD is, uh, do you know the will of God? And so how do, you, how do you know the will of God? Is there some place you can go in the Bible to see where the will of God is? There is. There is. There's a, there's a, a, a few of them in the Bible. One of them is, um, I got to make sure I got this right. One of them is, is Psalms, Pastor Jan, what is that? Psalms, what? Our Proverbs. So you can go there, and you can also go to Genesis. If you read in Genesis, you'll find out what the will of God is. So you need to do that. So anyway, <clears throat> as, uh, um, we need to uh, uh, ask ourselves, are you walking in God's love with your wife, or are you walking being self-centered? Most of the guys are pretty much self-centered. Most of the guys. I'm not saying everybody is, but most of the guys are pretty much self-centered. It's all, you get, it's all about them. It's all about me. Do I get my time? Do I get to do what I want? So um, he talks about that. We're going to do that, um, follow through on that. He's going to go through a number of... Um, Ephesian scriptures, one of them submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. We're supposed to submit ourselves to one another in the fear of God, not that we submit to one another without the fear of God, because that's really easy to do. If you want to be honest with yourself, you will agree with that. <clears throat> then why submit yourselves unto your husband as unto the Lord? Not that you need to be dominated by the husband, but let the Lord work through you. That's what he's talking about there. And husbands love your wives, even as Christ loved the church, and it gave it and gave himself for it. So, <clears throat> so men ought to love their, their wives and their own bodies, um, just like Jesus loved himself. And and he, what he did, what he came down off of that cross and what he did for us. You know, he did. He didn't just do it for the men. He did it for the women also. And we got to make sure that we as men don't uh, try to step over our bounds. You know, so um, <clears throat> there's, there's a, there are a number of things that we need to do. We, we need to remember first it's supposed to be God. Then second, it, it should be uh, the second should be um, if I get my page turned, I'll tell you what second should be family. family. That's right. Family is right. And then comes the ministry. You know, sometimes we get that real uh, confused and mixed up. Pretty sometimes we want to do the ministry first, but it's supposed to be God first, family, and then ministry. Uh, so. How do you do that? How do you keep that in order? You need to divide the word of God, rightly divide the word of God. And in James, um, 2 James 2.15, it says, Study to show you thyselves approved unto God a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So when we read that scripture, we need to ask ourselves, do you have a hunger for God in his word? And do you have an understanding of the word? You know, many people read the Bible, and they can rattle off scripture after scripture, but they really don't know. They really don't know the word because they haven't meditated on it, and they have no understanding of the word. Then it has to get from here to your heart. So that's the things that we ought to do. 
And so then you, we need to ask ourselves, are we serving God or are we just serving ourselves? And we, if we're serving God, we'll be serving our wife. If we're serving God, you'll get the, the word that will come, come through that faucet from God down to you so you can pass the nourishment on to your wife and family. So, so it, uh, we can read the word, but we also need to be a doer of the word. So in that uh, James 1, 22, he says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. So <clears throat> the other thing we got to be careful of, we got to be careful what comes from the outside, that we don't let ourselves be deceived by some false teachings, whether it be in another church or whether it be on TV or something you read. You got to make sure that you rightly divide the word. So that we don't don't come um, get out of whack in that area. So um, uh, Isaiah eight twenty says, "Look to God for instructions and teachings. People who contradict His word are completely in the dark. So if if you're in the dark, you can't see the light. So you got to make sure you're doing the right thing." Um, a couple other things. Um, you know, the Old Testament was not for was not for living. The Old Testament was for learning, and now we got the New Testament, which is for living because all the promises are in there. So we need to, you know, sometimes people want to just stay in the Old Testament. We also got to look at the New Testament also, so we know what the promises are, because you don't want to stay in the dark. People will know if you're not living by the word of God because they'll see it in your life and you don't know the and and they'll see that you don't really know the will of God. The only way you'll know the will of God is by rightly dividing the word and knowing what it says. Jesus served God by coming to this earth. How did Jesus serve him? By serving us as he still does today. And he died for us. Now the man is to serve the woman as Christ served the church. He gave us an example. He's, we just have to follow. We, we, want, we want to live by God, but we need to get God in us and do his work. So we're going to play that DVD from Creflo this morning, and then we'll go from there. So Keegan, you want to bring that up? Spiritual error is the result of the absence of scriptural knowledge. And as long as you have an absence of scriptural knowledge, you will continue to make spiritual error. And what can be worse than that? What can be worse than that is you think that your error is true. And you think that your error, you know, is true to the point where you defend it. And you think your error is truth, but now you become you become an enemy to the cross. Join us online as we give thanks for all that God has done. Don't miss our special Thanksgiving Day service, Thursday, November 25th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, streaming worldwide. God's grace has kept us, and we're so grateful for the opportunity to give thanks. Tune in through the Creflo Dollar Ministries TV app, YouTube, Facebook, or if you're in the Atlanta area, join us in person. We can't wait to celebrate with you. This is your world, so let's vow to make it. There can be no coming to the Father in the absence of Jesus. None. Forget it. Forget it. You ain't getting to God without Jesus? Well, I'm going to go through Mohammed. You ain't going to get there. You have to make up something. You have to pretend like you got there and then come back and tell a lie about it. Because you ain't getting to the Father without, you know, without, without Jesus. It ain't happening. It ain't happening. And, and, and some of y'all are going to be so shocked. Well, I'm going to heaven. There's going to be a bunch of versions. You're going to be shocked. I don't know where you got that from from the book. <laughs> You're going to be shocked. You're going to be shocked. 
See, I, I don't have to be concerned about defending and, and working real hard to prove this to you. Let me, let, me, let me say prove this to you. I'll defend the gospel, but I ain't got to work hard to prove it to you because everybody's going to die. And the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. You're going to die. And you remember Gomer Powell? Used to be a little comedy about this Marine named, from Mayberry. His name was Gomer. Gomer Powell. And Gomer Powell used to come up and say, surprise, surprise, surprise. That's what's going to happen to a whole lot of people when they die. And they're thinking one way and they didn't get it from the word. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Those of you who think, well, I'm just going to heaven. I, 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 oh, 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 no. Those of you who think, well, I just believe when you die, you just fall asleep. You're going to die and be like, oh, it's hot. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Notice what the Spirit of God calls the New Testament. This is so, this is so ministered to me. Notice what the Spirit of God, go to Hebrews chapter 8 and 6. Notice what the Spirit of God calls the New Testament, which Jesus is the mediator of. Notice what the Spirit of God calls the New Testament, which Jesus is the mediator of. Are you ready? He said, but now have he obtained a more, what, excellent ministry. By how much also he is the mediator of, watch this, a better covenant or testament, which was established upon better promises. You see, what? look at what he said. The Spirit of God said that, that, that this is a better covenant. It is a better testament. He said it. He said, all right, so, so, so put it together. This is better. This, this New Testament is better than the old one. This new covenant is better than the old one. <laughs> he said this New Testament got better promises in it than the old one. <laughs> I'm just convinced that when, when you hear certain teachings, that some people just not reading the Bible or don't understand that the cross is the defining line. And you got to know what that line is. It's kind of like football. The goal line, on the other side, just score. On the other side, I don't care how close you get to the line. If you don't make it on the other side of the line, it's better on the other side of the goal line than it is on one side. Amen. So why is it better? Oh, I'm going to get precise with this. Why is it better? Because Jesus is our daysman. It's better because we have a mediator. It's better because we have a go-between. It's better because we have someone that will cause peace to be made happen. It's, this New Testament is better because I have Jesus. In the Old Testament, I had a promise of him, but he wasn't there yet. And there was a prophecy of him, but he wasn't there yet. There was a talk of a Sabbath, but they thought it was a day. But we know that Jesus is our Sabbath. It is a better covenant because we have what Job didn't have, a mediator. We have what Job didn't have, a daysman. Hallelujah. Well, I feel like shouting in this place. I made my mind up that I don't know, which, whatever you didn't get, I don't know, nine, eight, ten years ago, I'm going around and I want to I wanna get so much precision. And it's up to you. You got to decide whether you're going to believe it. You, I'm going to lay it out as best that Holy Ghost let me lay it out. You got to decide whether or not you're going to believe it. But I'm going to tell you, if you can get an understanding of this word of life, your whole life going to change. Your whole life going to change. I, I don't know about you, but I'm fed up with people trying to be like God without him. Trying to understand God without the Bible. Trying to think they know God and don't even know these basic, simple truths of the Bible that once you apply them, you will see simply that what you were saying was just not right. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Let's keep going. So I have the Bible. That's not good enough, but now we need to talk about the importance of studying the Bible. I have it, but with the importance of, of studying in it, the, per, the importance of getting in that Bible that I don't have a Bible just to keep my birth certificates in it or to just hide money so nobody won't find it because I know don't nobody ever open the Bible. But as a Christian, I need to know how to study it. Well, you know, I ain't the preacher. You ain't talking about being no preacher. 
If, if you're going to live by it, you need to know how to study it. What you mean, know how to study? Just open it up and just read it. Now, it ain't that simple. That's why you're confused now. How do I study it? And what is the importance of studying the Bible? You would be shocked of the number of Christian people who come to church who haven't studied their Bible. There's a pandemic going on, and there's some people who, 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 who lead you to think that their Bible's in the middle of a pandemic, too, because they won't open it up. They treat their Bible like it got COVID-19. We can't touch the Bible or we might get contaminated. No, you get in that Bible, you'll get contaminated, all right. You'll get some Holy Ghost pandemic going on in your life. Man, I don't know what's going on. How do you expect to be a successful Christian and you, you still don't think that studying the Bible is important? Well, I don't understand. Well, that's what you're here for today. You're with me. I, I'll, stick with me. I'll, I'll, I'll go with it and I, I'll help you study the Bible. Get on the 24-hour network. We have a 24-hour network that preaches the word 24 hours a day, changing your world network, 24 hours a day to help you to figure out how to get in this word and study it. But nobody can make you pick the Bible up. Nobody can make you turn on the 24-hour network. Nobody can make you get involved in Grace Life Academy. Nobody can make you do that stuff. You got to be something that I hadn't seen in a long time, hungry for God. More hungry for God than you are your career. More hunger for God than you are your six figures. Hungry for God. Hungry for God. That you're rushing home so you can get in your quiet place, so you can open your Bible up, so you can speak to God and let him speak to you through, through the study of his word. Where's the hunger? What happened to it? Ain't nobody hungry no more. We hunger for everything else. You pick up your telephone before you go to the bathroom when you get up in the morning. You used to take the Bible when you go use the toilet. Now you take your telephone to see what's going on in the social media instead of seeing what's going on in the spirit. What's happening to us, man? The devil's deceived you. The devil trying to jack you up and destroy you and look at you when you're in your ditch and laugh at you and say, I fooled you, didn't you? I fooled you. And we are not going to be of that denomination. We're not going to be of that reputation of being fooled. We're not going to be of that church of being fooled. We're, we're going to say, no, devil, you the fool. We, you're not going to fool us. The devil think you're having a good time right now. And yet, in the middle of all of this, the glory of the, of the Lord is about to hit this place. Your house, your life, your family. More people come to the Lord than you've ever seen. You watch what I say? They dog us out, talk about us right now. All that's going to change. All that's going to change. Something happens when hell visits your house. Something happens when you done tried everything you could try and it didn't work. Something happens when they tell you that there's no hope in this world. God knows how to get everybody back to their knees. Hallelujah. God knows how to get everybody back to their knees. And I'm telling you, it's happening, church. It's happening. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. God knows how. God knows how. Yeah, he does. Even you who say, I'm an atheist and I don't believe, God knows how to get you. God knows how to get your attention, bro. You ain't the first atheist that God has saved. You ain't the first atheist that God had to turn his heart. And you know what God's going to use to get, to get you to change your mind? His goodness. He's going to be so good to you that you know you didn't deserve it. You know you didn't earn it. But he's just going to show up and do something you know it had to be God. And that by itself will put you on a journey to say, I got to, I got to get this thing right with God. The song you sing in the Baptist church, get right with God and do it now. And I'm saying that right now. Get your house in order. Get your house in order. This is the only time that mankind will ever have the opportunity to be saved without works. The only time, that the only, only time you have the opportunity to get saved without having to deserve it, to get saved without having to earn it. You better take advantage of it now because there's coming a time where men will be judged by their works. But right now, you can get saved. Amen. Look at this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 
In verse 15, he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. He says, correctly analyzing in one version. Rightly dividing. The, 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 the cross is the dividing line. Rightly dividing between what is the Old Testament and what is the New. Rightly dividing between what was talked about without, without a daysman or a mediator and what is talked about with a mediator. Rightly dividing. He says, it's study to show yourself approved unto God. You're a workman that needed not to be ashamed because you're rightly dividing. You're correctly analyzing the word of truth. What is true under the New Testament with Jesus as the mediator may not be what is true in the Old Testament without a mediator. So you see, you can't go to the Old Testament, throw it out and tell everybody to see it, and, and ignore the dividing line. Because that was true without a mediator. You see, under the old covenant, fire fell down and killed a hundred and something men. Elijah, remember that? Fire. He prayed fire, fall down, and it fell down and killed them, those leaders. But in the New Testament, Jesus was warning them. He said, uh, one of his disciples said, Lord, should we... Ask God to rain fire down like Elijah did, and Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you are of, and rebuke them. What happened? Why, why, why didn't Jesus just say, yeah? That's what they did in Elijah. They do it now. Jesus was trying to show them, this is a new day, bro. I'm here. I'm about to mediate a New Testament. That was without a mediator. That's why they wanted a mediator. That's why they needed a mediator. So the fire wouldn't fall down from heaven and burn people up no more. But now it's different in this, in this testament because Jesus is now there to save men and to be the peace offering. And they don't need no fire to come down and burn them up. See, that people do the same thing. It might not be with the fire, but it might be other scriptures that you'll take out of Old Testament setting and try to work it in the New Testament setting. And that's just like taking old wine and putting it in a new wine skin. What happens? It bursts and you don't get the benefit of the wine or the container. That's what we've been. That's what we've been. And so the big problem we got to deal with is the immaturity in the pulpit and the spiritual illiteracy in the pulpit. That you just can't get in the pulpit and just start preaching stuff. Because people are listening to you. And then I become the fool because I'm telling something that's true, but they're so used to listening to that fable, false stuff that when the true stuff come around, just like the Bible say, they'll call a lot of truth and then the truth a lie because they don't know. Look at Matthew 22 and 29. Matthew 22 and 29. This, this, is, this is cool. Matthew 22 and 29. Hallelujah. He says, Jesus answered and said unto them, you do err. Why? Why? Why do you err or error? You do err. Why? Because you don't know the scriptures. And he says, if you don't know the scriptures, you don't know the power of God. He says, you're an error because you don't know the scripture. You, you're not an error because you, you know you didn't pray long enough. You're not an error because you didn't fast last Friday. You're an error because you don't know the scripture. Think of that. You, 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 you're not in error because, oh, I laid hands on them too sick and that's why they didn't, get, they didn't get healed. You're in error because you don't know the scriptures. Think of that. Ignorance is the reason why, 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 we, why we err. We are in error because we don't know the scriptures. Spiritual error is the result of the absence of scriptural knowledge. And as long as you have an absence of scriptural knowledge, you will continue to make spiritual errors. And what can be worse than that? What can be worse than that is you think that your error is truth. And you think that your error, you know, is truth to the point where you defend it. And you think your error is truth. Well, now you become, you become an enemy to the cross, trying to protect what's error. But spiritual ignorance has you in error. And spiritual error is the result of the absence of spiritual, scriptural knowledge. 
Colossians 2.8 in the NLT. Let's look at that. He says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking. <laughs> human thinking. And from the spiritual powers of this world. And rather than from Christ. He says, there's some things that come that don't come from Christ. There's some things that come, he calls them empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking. Human thinking that's passed down from one human to another human. Think about that. What if you are the victim of a religious way of thinking that has been passed down from one human to another human? It happens. I can go back to the 1800s, and I see this guy said this, and then he come down, he passed it down, and that guy said what he said, and he passed it down, and that guy said what he said, that he said, and it just keeps passing down, and it gets in the church, and, and, and it becomes this, this, this mark that it must be so. Why? Because that's what they always said. And that's what I ran into. I started saying things differently that was going against what was being passed down from one human to another human and that religious philosophy. And when you start going against that human philosophy, then, then, then all of a sudden it's a conspiracy. All of a sudden, you know, it, it's like, oh, my God, what is this guy saying? That's not what we've always heard. I never forget, man. You know, we've always heard. It was passed down from human thinking to human thinking. God is in control. Huh? And you always heard that. God is in control. And I never forget, man, I got rebuked for that, and I had to go and study it. And I looked in the book of Genesis, and the Bible says that God gave all the control over the earth to man. That if something crazy is going on, it's because man's in control, and he won't use his authority. No, but brother Donald, God is in control. Yeah, that's a philosophy that's been passed down from human being to human being. But if you read the scripture, God made it very clear. I have given authority to man over all the works of my hand. Yeah, but God is still in control. See, you won't submit to what the word says because you have been captured by empty philosophy and a high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking, passed down from human to human. And it's a lot easier to put the blame on God than to accept the authority that God has given you. And you know what? When you don't accept that authority in that area, you won't accept the authority to cast out devils, to rebuke sickness, to handle all the other stuff because it's easier for you to say God's in control than for you to say, I lay hold of the authority that God has given to me as a man in the earth to execute this authority. Yep. Mm -hmm. And some of y'all freaking out right now. Oh, now, wait a minute now. My grandmama told me that God was in control. I don't care what your grandmama said. You ain't going to find it nowhere in the New Testament, baby. <laughs> it's going to be tight and right. It's going to be hard, but it's going to be God. And if you can hang in here with me, if you ain't too scarred, if you ain't no little spiritual punk, if you're going to hang in here with me over the next several months, your life is going to change, and things that should be working right will begin to work right because you are free from the fables and the philosophies of this world. Look at Isaiah 8.20 in the NLT. This, 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 this Isaiah, you know, you can see prophetic things in the Old Testament as it begins to talk about stuff. And, 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 and there's a lot of truth in the Old Testament. The Bible said this about the Old Testament. Those things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. Not for our living, but for our learning. We live by that New Testament, but we can look at the things in the Old Testament, and it, we can learn some stuff, and we can grab hold of some stuff. Amen. Written for our learning. We keep thinking that it was written for our living. We live under the New Testament. We learn based on what was written aforetime. Look what he says here. He said, look to God's instructions and teachings. People who contradict his word are completely in the dark. <laughs> and that was, that's, that's something I can learn from Isaiah. I learned that from Isaiah. Look at God's instructions. Look at his teachings. People who contradict his word are completely in the dark. So be careful that you don't reveal to us that you're the one that's completely in the dark. So you got to read and study the Bible for yourself. 
This is the will of God for you. Real quickly, Ephesians 4, 14, Acts 20 and, and 32, 2 Timothy 3, 16. Let's look at these real quick. Read and study the Bible for yourself. This is the will of God for you. We're so busy asking God, what's your will for me? And, and he has a path for you. He has an anointing for you. But we're not even doing first base will of God. <laughs> we, want, we want ultimate will of God. And, and, and you don't understand that first base will of God, which is studying and, and getting in the word, is going to lead you to ultimate will of God. And there's so many people that are ignoring first base will of God. Well, I mean, what, how is it that you get saved, get a Christian t-shirt that says I'm a Christian, and you don't study the word, first base will of God. Get in the word and study it. He said that we henceforth be no more children. So he don't want you to be children all your Christian life. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind, watch this, of doctrine. Some guy comes up with a new teaching and you go for it. Somebody comes up and then you go for it. So as, you, know, you get tired of the, the, the truth of the word of God and you're looking for different winds of teaching. Oh, I like him. He's teaching on that. I never heard it like that before. I really like that. It ain't got to be the truth. It's just a new wind. That's what children do. Children, children just like candy. They don't want to keep eating their vegetables. Honey, over the next few months, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna prepare some, some spiritual food for you, boy. Some, some collard greens and Okra, you understand? Some of that real crackling cornbread. You got to see what I'm talking about now. Tater salad, shut your mouth up. So you understand what I'm saying? We're going we're gonna to do that. You're going to eat something that's going to be nourishing. Did you know that the thing... All right. That was a lot to digest. It's great. You know, I go back and thinking of, uh, you know, when this... Uh, pandemic came out and stuff, many people had solutions to how it was going to be taken care of, how it was going to work out and stuff. My thoughts was, Jesus is our mediator today. And I still hold on to that. He's our mediator. He's the one that's going to take care of this. He's going to work this all out. we got to always remember, God, it says, God will not leave us or forsake us. He's going to take care of us. I, I look at the same thing, what's going on in our politics today. You know, so many people are saying this and that and listening to that on social media and all that. They, it, there's one person that's going to take care of this whole thing, and it is Jesus. And we, we need to keep that in the forefront, not what we see. You know, in the, um, what Creflo was saying there as far as getting off on the word, um, I see many people do that because, oh, i seen this on that preacher on TV. He was saying it this way. I think he's right. Then, oh, i seen it over here. I think he's right. They get so confused. You, know, you need to get in one line of teaching and see that vision of the line of teaching and, and continue on it. Yeah. When, when they talk about you know, I know a lot of you like to listen to, uh, what's that radio station, K-Love? A lot of you like to listen to that. How many times on K-Love do you see, hear God is, uh, God is in control? It, you hear it over and over. I bet you if you listen to that station uh, three, four hours, you probably heard it three, four times. And, and that's not true because where are they getting that? Like Creflo says. It's in Genesis. We were given the authority. It was given yeah. over to us. You know, and, and it's easy to get off because if you hear something that's not truth or not fact, you hear it over and over. Pretty soon, you start to believe it. Just, just uh, do a self-check on yourself about that. You will do it. You know, and like... like um, I, I like to listen to Joel Osteen a lot, but he says that a lot. And so when he says that, you know, I have to tune that part out of his message. He's got great, great messages. He's inspirating and, you know, and he's usually uplifting. But when he says that God's in control, kind of, kind of dulls his message. When he, he, you have, who, who is that that says you got to eat the chicken and spit out the bones? <laughs> That's what you have to do sometimes. So, um, um, I'm not going to say a whole lot more. I want you guys to take this and 
you know, get the DVD, listen to it over and over. I don't want to say something today to confuse you because I think uh, Kreff will put it in real good words, uh, words that you can understand. And like he says, we need to, we need to digest the word. And how you're going to do it is, the only way you're going to do it is get into the Bible and study it. You know, some people go to, oh, I go to the Bible all the time. What are they, what are they getting? They're really not getting the wisdom and the understanding. They need to study it to really do it. And, you know, it, it takes some effort to do that. Some of us, we, go, we get so busy with everything else, and we want to ignore that. So, um, get in there, study it, divide the word rightly, make sure. You know, if you have questions about something was said, if you have questions about something Creflo said today, look it up. Look it up. Find out for yourself. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to do it. I just think about what uh, Brenda and Keish is doing for the school boards. They're just not walking in there and without some knowledge and wisdom about it. They're going in with some background. And that's what we're supposed to do with the word. We're supposed to get in it and go. So, okay, that's what I have for today. So, amen. amen. All right, I pray a blessing over each and every one. Go and have a good day in the Lord. And remember who is in control. You, are, you have that authority. You can control what you do going forward today. So I just give that over to Jesus. Let Jesus be the Lord of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.